All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, regular school board meeting for Monday, September 27th, 2021 to order. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody who uh, has joined us tonight and we'll go ahead and do a quick roll call of the board members present. Jeremy Mask, present. Sarah, Roger Kanoi, present. Sarah Hughes, present. Eddie Vanami, present. And we'll go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the agenda had been posted. Is there any discussion um, or even a motion to approve the agenda? Oh, do we have an amendment to the agenda? All right, that was a facetious question because I know we do. Um, there is an addition under section nine Number three, the addition is Joshua Klein hired as a maintenance worker. We'll need to have that in a motion to amend the agenda to accept that. I'll move to accept the amended agenda. I'll second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the amended agenda. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda has been approved. Take a moment to review the I-35 mission statement and district priorities. Our mission statement, the Interstate 35 Community School District exists to develop lifelong learners and responsible, productive, successful citizens in an ever-changing society. Our district priorities, A, articulate and support a cohesive student-centered pre-K through 12 vision for continuous school improvement, B, engage in effective teaching and relevant learning for the 21st century, and C, operate with fiscal integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness. We're gonna to start tonight with our education spotlight. Yeah, so I am pleased to welcome um, our new staff. I thought they could get up and wave, or if they wanna come down and um, introduce themselves, they can. But um, we'll start on the end. Um, Mr. Brant Payne is our new um, band, or band director. Um, and then we have the Coleman's. We have Danae, who is our choir um, teacher, and Alex, who is our science teacher at the high school. And then Katie Klingensmith, who is our new ag FFA. And then Haley Young is our interventionist at the middle school. And Allison Richard is our um, kindergarten teacher. Um, if you remember, we added a section at kindergarten. So she came on about, what, two days before school started? A week and a half, so very, very soon. <laughs> um, she, she did a great job getting the, the room ready. And of course, I think you all have met Brayton Weber, who is our um, athletic director and special services director. We also have um, two new, um, one eighth grade um, language arts teacher, Tana, Tanya Donahue, who is coaching middle school volleyball right now. And Stephanie Romanga is coaching middle school volleyball right now. So they are in the gym. Hopefully they'll pop in and you can see them when they get here. Um, Sharon Whitson, who just came in, is our new health PE um, instructor at the high school. Who am I? And Jamie Lee is our new um, interventionist at the high school. So uh, that's, our, that's our new crew and um, they all are, are doing exceptional. So we're pleased they're here. Welcome, everybody. And you can you, ask him anything yeah, you want. Yeah, I was like. going to say, do you guys have any questions for us? So during open house, I tried to make my rounds and meet as many of the new faces as possible. And I know I didn't get to everybody. And so if you ever see me around, catch me, say hi, and I'll try and do the same. So. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now we'll move on to our open forum. Looks like we've had three people sign up to speak and I'll just read from the top here. Um, 
Kevin Stewart. Yeah, the microphone right down here. Oh, can I, can I quickly read a statement? Sure. Okay. Residents, students, parents, guardians, and staff members of the district may address the board about relevant topics. Those who wish to speak must sign up at the beginning of the meeting. Speakers' participation is limited to five minutes per meeting. We ask speakers to remember that Iowa law prohibits the board from discussing specific employees or students or their performance. Floor is yours. Okay, my name is Kevin Stewart. I live uh, south of town here uh, about, uh, about two miles. Uh, both my kids graduated from, uh, from I-35. Uh, first, I <clears throat> would commend the uh, school board as I realize it is a thankless job that, uh, and you probably won't be thanking me after this, but in anyway, uh, I appreciate starting out with the Pledge of Allegiance at the uh, school board meetings, the second one I've been to, and uh, pre appreciate the uh, freedom on the uh, on the mask issue. I received my property tax statement, oh, it's been, been a month ago now, actually a little over a month ago, and noticed that I-35 is getting an additional uh, $250,000 in property taxes this year, and just wanted to know how that is allocated and uh, how you're planning on spending that and what you're going to do going forward to uh, control costs and maybe uh, reduce some of the uh, uh, property tax burden on, on the uh, you know, patrons within the school district. And with that, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, next is Andy Boyce. My name is Andy Boyce. I have a couple kids here at I-35. I just wanted to make my own opinion voiced and known. Um, normally I wouldn't feel like I would have to do this just because currently these mask ruling that you have at the moment is no masks. But I was informed last year that that would be the same case. So I would just want to present to you again, please keep it the way that it is. We do not need to be masking our children. There's a thousand and one reasons not to. That's the first thing. I'll back that up a little bit. I do love this school. I want my kids to stay here. I want my kids to go here. And I would say, we, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the teachers, the district, the, the families, the people around here, they're about as good as you can get anywhere. And I don't want anything like what's going on in the Des Moines districts, the Ankeny districts, those places where people are fighting. They're having problems with each other. We should be able to get along and discuss things and, and enjoy each other's company and respectfully talk about issues. The second thing is the CRT, which is critical race theory, if you don't know what that is. Clearly, there is a ruling given by the, the governor that it's not allowed to be taught in schools. But if, if you know anything, there are teachers in various locations, whether it's elementary, I, I know it's probably not going directly on a lot there, but up through colleges that are teachers that are specifically saying they're going to find ways to get around this. There's language that can be used that's changed that pushes critical race theory. Now, I don't mean to, I'm not pushing this out there as I'm special for whatever. My children are half Asian and half white. And if we're gonna be pushing something like this, it does affect me and it will make me upset. This is the hill I will die on. I won't stand for that kind of thing to be pushed because it pushes um, ill, ill, I don't know how to explain it. it. It doesn't put every person on an equal scale. What it does is it pits one race or pits one uh, sex or pits one group against another and that's not right we're not here to be doing that kids are here to learn math English social studies language arts those things and that's what I want them to learn I want them to grow and I want them to get out into the world and be the best that they can be and I think we're doing a fair good job at that I just want it to be known whether it's just me and I don't think it's just me 
I think there's plenty of other people that agree with me, not just sitting there, but out in the communities, the people that I know. That's what they want. The masks, CRT, and, and other things that we have to be paying attention to. We are watching. We know that you have a hard job, and thank you for doing it. That's my opinion on things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Nathan Gibson. Hey, Eddie. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, Roger. Sharon. Um, now, I had something to talk about this evening, but um, based off the uh, opening, I think, thank you, you read off here. Um, speakers remember that Iowa law prohibits board members, um, you know, from discussing specifics. So that infers that this can be an interactive uh, a dialogue question and answer. So one of the things I want to bring up is the placement of the open forums on the on the agenda. Um, if you look at, you know, uh, section seven where it says superintendent's report, Sharon, you have uh, a particular item on there, questions about the, the judge's ruling. <clears throat> this is the only information that, that I have. I don't have context on what is about to be talked about, and I don't have context of any information that may have been shared with each of you beforehand. So it's very difficult for me to come up and have you know, a dialogue about something that I don't know what's about to, to be discussed. So one of the things I wanna ask is, can we, um, in, in interest of transparency, which I know you guys are working on, can we um, think about rearranging some of this stuff in the future. Um, so, so some of these more hot topic items are before the open forum, so we get a chance to hear the data that you're presenting um, to the board. And I, I'll, be, I'll be transparent. Facts can be manipulated to push any narrative. Like every fact that Sharon may bring, I can come up and bring an equivalent fact. And unfortunately, we're in a day and age that that's just what it is. I'll give you an example. COVID is a threat to our kids that continues to be said, you know, we have, what, what's the metric that's used? High infection rates, you know, and, and, and that's what the inner schools are using. And that may be data that you bring. But I can come up and counter that and say, hey, did you know that 0.079% of all COVID deaths in the U.S. are related to COVID? That's a different fact when you look at it from that lens, right? And, and whether we like it or not, our healthcare system, Madison County Healthcare, Iowa Department of Public Health, the CDC, they're picking specific facts to push a narrative. So I would just like to know in the future, can we be a little bit more thoughtful about, you know, the high topic items that we can have a discussion and hear what you present, or at least maybe get any data that the board may see beforehand. Is that a possibility that we can have a dialogue about that? Yes? yes. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so, so with that, you know, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, I underlined on the, the mission statement, successful citizens. And we have that in there. And, and I wanna talk about my idea of a successful citizen, and I think it emulates a lot of this community. And, and Sharon, you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again, we're not the Des Moines Public School District. And everybody out here is specifically here because we don't want to be part of the Des Moines Public School District. And a specific example of that, I teach my kids to say yes sir and yes ma'am, but in the same breath to say I will not comply. And, and, and when it comes time when tyranny is evident, when somebody is forcing something upon my kids that they don't want to do because of a .079 death rate or because a, a very small minority, that's where I teach them I will not comply. Now, I don't want them to. I don't want to ever have to repeat what happened at the end of the school year last year that destroyed me and it destroyed a lot of people. But I want us to remember when we're looking at that facts, this community, when we're making those decisions, we need to look at our definition of a successful citizen. And our definition in this community specifically is we're going to teach our kids that we don't co-parent with the government. We don't co-parent health decisions with, with the school. Now, I understand that you have a, a duty for the health and safety of the school, but that only goes so far, right? And, and if kids aren't dying, if more kids died because of the flu, again, these are facts that aren't coming out, then that's something you, you should consider. 
But I, I, I will say if we don't change the way we're having this dialogue and get transparency with the data and give us parents an opportunity to chime in, then you're going to hear, I will not comply. And it will be a lot more than the 13 strong. We started a little revolution last year that ended up with governor's pens because of our kids. I do not want to have to go through that again, but it's going to be bigger next time. So I just ask, please, let's be transparent with the data. Give us parents an opportunity to chime in on that data um, before we make any decisions. So that's what I'm asking for. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. All right. Do we have a student representative report? I did not get one from Will, no. Okay. We'll move into the principal reports. I go ahead and start with that one. Um, <clears throat> school year is going off great. We're in week four, I believe, already. It's hard to, hard to keep track. Um, it's hard to believe it's going to be October already this weekend. Um, we're solidly through fast testing, kind of digging through that data. Um, seeing some weak spots and working on what can we do to strengthen those. Uh, we've got some trainings coming up for some diagnostic stuff to, to help solidify some of that, that work that we're doing. Um, coming up this week, we've got our first marathon of Roadrunners, if you remember that from years before. Uh, every classroom nominates a student of character to participate in that. We will make our lap around the elementary again. Um, something fun that the kids really enjoy and it's it's a, it's a good way to celebrate those students who are continuing to show uh, good character and, and demonstrating our, our PBIS expectations. Um, got a field trip coming up this week. Uh, fourth grade's heading to the iCubs game. Um, they're kind of tying that into some lessons they're doing in the classroom, so it's really exciting to see what, what that's going to look like as they bring back some data that they're going to collect at the game and, and, and make some lessons out of that. Um, <clears throat> continuing to work on our standards. Uh, making sure that they align up with our report cards and it's hard to believe that we're again we're already looking at our first reporting period coming up um, remember the elementary switched to trimesters uh, this year so our first reporting term will be uh, the week before conferences so I think October 30th is the the end of our trimester um, so that's when our report cards will be um, coming out uh, we did that change again to align that with conferences so that when they have a conference report or parent-teacher conference and they're showing a report card, that is current data from just the week before, um, where when we were on quarters, sometimes that was three weeks, four weeks before conferences, so it would be a little bit more timely information. Um, so we're, we're working on that and, and just updating what standards are going to be on the report card so that they align with our, our power standards for, for math reading, and we're even getting into some so science and social studies work um, on that as well. So. A lot of things going on, a lot of excitement in the halls. Kids are, kids are excited to be here, and, and we're excited to be here as well. So any questions? Could you expand on that FAST data that you said the holes in the FAST data? Is that just COVID-related, or have you, have you had time to actually dig in and analyze it, or should I just wait? On the question for another I'll have more information as, a, as we dig into it. we haven't really dug into it we just we see some low spots okay. it's hard to pinpoint if it's COVID related or not I mean I'm sure some of it is but I think some of it is, is showing some weaknesses maybe in in some of our programs um, so we'll continue to dive into that and, and see what what that means for us as far as continuing to strengthen our programs and, and strengthen, strengthening our core and our intervention programs so Hopefully we can we can work our way out of that, but um, yeah, it's we, we expected to see a, a bit of a dip. I mean, when kids lose a quarter of the year, um, but as long as we keep looking at that data and making decisions based on that to continue to improve, um, I think that's the main thing. Got it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Mr. Tessaw? Thank you very much. Ms. Dutry. Is this thing on? Hello? Oh, yes. It's good. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk real quickly about middle school clubs. This year we started um, middle school clubs to help improve the culture, and they are every Friday, first hour. There are a multitude of different clubs that middle school students are in involved in, including a craft club, spirit, 
club, martial arts, running club, kindness club, fantasy football. Um, students read to first graders, their fourth grade math buddies. There's a bucket drumming club, um, club chill, escape rooms, a mini society, a nature outdoor skills club. Uh, they work on origami, student council, woodworking, a walking and talking club, sewing 101, Harry Potter, games and relaxing art. So all of our middle school teachers, along with some elementary teachers, some shared teachers, some administrators, um, just different people in the building who happen to be available during that time on Fridays, um, facilitate different middle school groups to kind of start building relationships with kids who need a safe place or someone to kind of make that connection with something that they enjoy doing. So I'm hoping to branch out and include community members also who might be available on Fridays. It is from 8.15 to 9 o'clock, so I know that's kind of a tricky time, but as we continue to grow this program, I just hope that it's a way that we can continue to get our kids um, excited about coming to school, but also learning some new things and trying some new things that might be lifelong skills that they're interested in, some hobbies that they can um, join. So that's one thing that's been going on the last month that will continue throughout the year. Um, within the high school and middle school both, um, we've been working in our PLC groups um, in the secondary. We're about four weeks in. There's different things happening in the PLCs with our teachers. Um, UBD planning, aligning their standards to their assessments, working towards their standards-based grading, just kind of different depending on where teachers are within their PLCs, they're working on different things. Um, we had our first PD day where teachers started the conversations about a book that we're reading, Making Grades Matter, as we continue working on the standards-based grading piece. Um, we also had time during PD for some colleague conversations, which I think was a huge bonus. Um, teachers from different areas got to just have conversations with each other about what things were working in their classrooms, and I think the teachers really appreciated that time to um, have those conversations. This week we are starting, this week we are having our fast testing for our ninth through 11th graders. So uh, Mr. Tessaw talked a little bit about the elementary results. So this year we're expanding that to include high school students, which we haven't done in the past, just to kind of start making sure that we're looking at the data, not just in the elementary, but throughout the high school as well, so that we can get supports and interventions to those students who need them as well. So on Thursday, our ninth through 11th graders will be taking both the A reading and A math fast tests to make sure that we are catching any students who might need extra support or if they're above and beyond, what can we do to be helping enrich them as well. Um, with that, we also have a new math and high school interventionist who have been doing some great work with especially our math right now. Um, they started the year kind of pushing more into the math classrooms and figuring out um, what can we do in the classrooms, and now they're starting to find specific students who need that support outside of the classroom and finding interventions that they can help support those kids during their study halls or different ways to kind of get them what they need so that they can be successful in the classrooms. Uh, Mrs. Boyd and her foods class is at it again. Last week they had um, mini sliders, uh, Philly cheesesteak and french fries. I think this Friday they have like a bacon take or take and bake, so um, be on the lookout for her great food. Last Monday, Joe Beckman was here and talked to our kids about being a difference maker instead of a difference faker or difference taker. Um, he's planning to come back again multiple times throughout the year, just keeping um, our students not just their content, but also the character piece of making our kids um, you know, well-rounded and ready for um, being great members of society when they leave here. So those are all some of the great things that are happening in the secondary. Any questions? I had a question. I guess I'm assuming that the, the middle school clubs, those interests came from the students, or did we give, sure. I didn't know how that was decided. Sure. So to be honest, this first set did not come from the students okay. um, because we kind of just started them. Um, however, when the students picked, they did get to pick which group they were part of. So when they started, the teachers 
the teachers decided like, here's the club I'm gonna offer first quarter. And then we gave the list to kids and said, which club do you wanna be a part of? And then the last question on the kids survey is after you've picked which club you wanna be a part of, now what are some ideas of clubs that you think we should have second quarter? Okay. So we do have okay. some ideas from kids for second quarter that maybe we hadn't thought of for first quarter, but the first quarter clubs were made up by the okay. teachers and kind of what they were passionate about. Well, and you, that way you can <laughs> get yep. those matched yep. up and with yep. the second quarter. And then I just wanted to make a comment about um, the Joe Beckman. I saw some things on social media. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I would like to come yeah. <laughs> with yeah. that. So I think, I hope that was the response from the kids and so yeah. on too. Yeah, I so. think so too, because, so he was here two days and the first day it was kind of like a all inclusive, like the kids were just in the auditorium. And then the second day he did some small groups with different oh. groups of kids. And so, they knew that the second day he was coming back, it was gonna be smaller groups. And Steve mentioned that kids were asking him, so which groups of kids is he meeting with? If I'm not a part, can I be a part of that group? Or So I do think kids were very excited about him for sure. Good, good. And Sarah, we are gonna have a parent portion of that when he comes okay. back. Um, I think it might be the January date, but I'm not 100% sure. So we'll get that out Great. well in advance. So parents, community can come in as well for part of that. So real quick on the clubs, um, I'm getting to see some origami come home, which is amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm excited to see where you guys can take that over the yeah. next semesters, you know, whether it be next year and see where those different interests lie. So I think that's exciting. I, I, I really think the students are excited about it. Yeah. Um, and then my second thing was on the fast testing, you said this happened starting this week, I think is what you yeah. said. What's the timeline for that as far as how long does it take for them to take the testing? And then when do you actually start to get some results back? Yeah, so the results are pretty automatic because it's an online test. So okay. um, the testing will all take place on Thursday. So they will take both the math and reading test on Thursday. And then we'll have tests pretty automatic um, in terms of what that looks like for when we start kind of digging into that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the sooner the better. It just kind of depends on, you know, I think our interventionists will be a big part of what that looks like digging into it. Um, I know our admin team will definitely dig into that as well. Um, but maybe some grade level teams will dig into that during their PLCs. It just kind of depends on what those protocols look like. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Not hearing any, thank you very much. I will say, I'll just add to that though. I, I don't doubt that by the next board meeting, we will have some more information for you about what those results look like and what our next steps are. So I don't mean to like, ah, well, sure, next time. I mean, by the next board meeting, we for sure will have more information about what that looks like. I, I like the sound of immediate results, of course. Okay. But, okay. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah. just, you know, yeah. being able to have something to be actionable soon, that's, that's Absolutely. great. So yep. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Mr. Weber. I would like to follow up on Ms. Uh, Dutry's. I'm actually one of the leaders of the uh, fantasy football league for middle schoolers. <laughs> And I am getting beat by quite a few middle school boys in that league. So if that tells you anything about my skills. Um, <clears throat> so first up for me, I'll do the, uh, the special ed report. Um, uh, we actually had, I believe, seven new additions to our special ed team. Um, I know Sharon had the teachers here, but that's also the associates as well. Um, and so we've been kind of lucky with not only getting a bunch of new ones that made me nervous coming into this role, because that's a, that's a big number of new staff into any department. Um, but with the addition of Margot and Stacy's uh, mentoring program that's come along that you guys approved over the summer, I know they worked on all last year to get it up and going, I think has been a, a massive help to getting all those new staff ready to go. I also think it's gonna mean a lot less turnover in the future and we keep their, these employees going forward. So um, that's just better for our kids. Um, so they've been great to work with. Um, we've seen an uptick in the number of special ed kids in the district this year um, compared to the last couple. Quite a few move-ins coming in this year. Um, a handful of additional one-on-one -on -one and two-on-one -on -one supports, which has meant more associates. Um, so right now we're kind of spread thin. Uh, we do have two associate openings that I'm still trying to fulfill. Um, had phone interviews before this meeting. And then a, uh, an open teacher position that we're trying to fulfill, um, which we have an interview for on Wednesday morning. So 
trying to kind of button up and have a little extra as we have staff that get sick or family that get sick or kids. Um, you don't want to have our kids get behind, so trying to have a little extra to where we can spread it out. Um, obviously, as everyone knows, with special ed, what we get from the state doesn't fulfill everything we need, so we fit with what we can. Um, but like I said, the staff that we have right now has been just great to work with, and I think we'll continue to serve our kids as best we can. So um, questions on special ed before I go to activities? Yeah, and you said there's more, more special ed kids. Is, are we just identifying more? You said there was some move-ins, but are we doing a better job of identifying special ed needs? Or so is it from everything I've seen, last year we identified quite a few more at the younger age levels than we had maybe the year before that. And then just since I've got here, we've had quite a few additional move-ins. Um, not only that, maybe a couple like in one family. So again, that just extrapolates out that number. Um, and to be fair, when I'm looking at like the list I got in June and the number of associates I had, we kind of thought we felt pretty good. And then when you identify additional students that need a two-on-one or a one-on-one, that kind of eats up a lot of the support that we were spreading out with other kids' minutes. So again, just trying to make sure we're, we're getting them what they need to, to get them back to grade level. Um, one quick question on the on the teacher opening that you have is that something that was not fulfilled at the beginning of the year or an additional need that we realized because of the additional students or what's kind of driving a, that a, additional a combination teacher? of those two so okay. um, it was a hire that was made um, that then did not work out due to okay. a couple different extenuating circumstances so mm -hmm. um, so we listed it quite right away um, I was lucky that I I, I think I knew somebody that's going to be able to join us so I'm hoping it's all going to work out so we've okay. been working on that just over the last week so, okay. Um, anything else? Let's see. All right. Activities. I uh, just got done with homecoming week just over a week ago. Um, it was a lot of fun for me being new to the district to see um, the elementary, middle school, high school, all the days identified, uh, what everyone was going to dress up as, seeing teachers get into it um, was a lot of fun, and even the administrators. Um, ending with that homecoming, you know, pep rally, and that I found out the day before I was helping MC down in the gym, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and then with the football game Friday night, uh, which I thought went off without a hitch um, and, and went really well. Obviously got the W, which is always good. Um, overall, uh, activities has been a lot of fun this fall. Um, we, going into football, if you look at like last week, uh, we had both middle school uh, teams, which I know a couple of you guys are at, I've seen you, uh, win their games. And then we had our ninth grade team, which again, that's a new, new coaching position and a new level for us um, that went and won their game. And then, uh, and then Friday night varsity game. So it was a clean sweep last week. Um, that success has been seen in other sports too. Uh, cross country, the boys brought home a championship from the Crest invite, which was the first one in as many years as the coach could remember. Um, and then, which we have a plaque for that we need to get up, you know, once our new stands come in or our award plaque area come in. And then uh, the girls have been top six, I think four times with, um, I know Abby Goring winning multiple different invites. And again, um, coach said that uh, that's the highest finish our girls have had a number of years that she can remember. So um, that's trending in the right direction. And then volleyball has been a lot of fun to watch. Um, I, like, I like being able to live stream that and sit up there and watch all the levels. Um, obviously, that's an entire new coaching staff, um, though Tim McKinney's been around um, in all their positions, both middle school and high school. Those are all new coaches. And um, I've seen them just fight and be so close in so many matches. And then, what was it, a week ago Saturday, go to a tournament and um, take second in their pool and fourth overall, which was awesome to see. So I know, I know Coach Brandy's going to have that clicking and, and moving on as um, going forward. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun things from all of our fall sports and already getting ready to turn the leaf to winter here pretty soon. So hopefully that success continues. So questions about activities? I do have a quick question. Um, one thing I hear from a lot of people in the community, parents, grandparents, whatever, is the streaming stuff, mm -hmm. which really got ramped up last year. Yep. And a lot of people really like it, whether they're out of town for work or grandparents out of town. And I know that's a lot of that burden is falling on you, yep. staff, that. <laughs> Any ideas for like a long-term plan on how we may be able to get that more in the students' bucket to, you know, have some opportunities for them to grow with that? So, you know, I tried, uh, and I want to get better at it, I tried to offer service hours, I tried to offer things, and just weren't able to gravitate, you know, to get somebody on. I also know with that, you know, when I'm at a volleyball game, it's hard. I, I haven't been to the volleyball games in years past, but parents have told me that student section doesn't normally look like that. And so I would hate to pull one of them. I and mean, we usually, I think we have over 100 kids at the high school level in that student section for a volleyball team, I'm fine sitting up on the bleacher taking it, you know. Um, I know football, we've been able to get staff going. Um, when it comes to long term, 
yeah, I would like to get the high def and I'd like to get the, the, the ones that will look better on the TV screen. The problem is it's really expensive. And so um, I've gotten some of those bids in so we can start looking forward. Um, but right now I just wanted to make sure we offer it so that those grandparents at home or because of health reasons, people aren't coming out, um, they can still see it and not miss out on it. So, okay. but it's definitely on the agenda. I'm gonna keep looking at it, so. Anything else? All right, thanks guys. Thank you. All right, that moves us to the superintendent report. Yeah, so the first um, item on there is the questions about the judge's ruling, and that happened about two, two and a half weeks ago. Um, I did send a letter out to parents and to staff members just uh, reiterating what we're doing. I've had a couple of questions from board members that I thought I should just talk about in, in public so that everybody hears the same information. Um, but the first question was, um, are we reporting out still our numbers? And just like last year, we'll report out if we have more than six um, positive cases in any given week, and we've not hit that threshold yet this year. So um, that's why we're not reporting that out. Um, we'll probably do it on Tuesdays again, like we did last year, just it seemed to work well um, once we knew coming back Monday. So um, our numbers are very low and, and we're um, optimistic that they're gonna stay that way. Uh, the second question I had was, um, does this impact, does, does the ju judge's ruling impact? And one of the things that we talked about and really what we reiterated all of last year was that we follow Iowa Department of Public Health guidelines. And if you remember in May, those guidelines changed. And so then we, we removed masks from kids. Those, li those guidelines are still what they were in May. So barring those changing, I don't anticipate us changing, or at least my recommendation would be not to change what we're currently doing. Um, if public health guidelines change, then obviously that's a, a conversation that we'll have to have at that time, just like we did last year when they changed. So um, I, I don't anticipate being anything different as a result of the judge's ruling from what we're doing right now. Um, but like I said, I, it's not something that I can guarantee we're never gonna have the conversation because we don't know what's coming, what's next. So um, I, I guess those are the two kind of big questions that we've gotten about that. And, and it doesn't really impact anything that we're currently doing. And we will report numbers once we get to that threshold of six or more. And we do that, remember, because of privacy. Um, so uh, those, are the, those are the only real significant questions I've had. I've had people ask, um, you know, have we had conversations about it? And of, of course, we've had conversations about the judge's ruling because we have to. I think that um, when we do have to pay attention to health and safety, I do know that the, I was t notified today that the injunction um, on the, the law is now two weeks extended. Um, but it, again, I, it doesn't really impact anything we're doing here because our public health guidelines haven't changed and our, and our numbers don't warrant that we we do anything different. So um, I just wanted to make sure you guys had an opportunity to ask questions if you have them. Um, and so then if, if having the conversation, public has questions um, beyond this, they can email us and we can make sure we get that communicated. But those are really the only questions I've had. So I wanted to make sure everybody heard it at one time and then give you guys the opportunity to ask questions that you want me to follow up on and get communication out for. Okay. I, I do have a question for you, Sharon. Um, and I know you're going to be talking about staffing shortages, mm -hmm. but uh, is, while the numbers are not greater than six, are we seeing a higher absenteeism now than, than we would normally? Well, we're, we're seeing, and I think this is just in general, we're seeing um, more illness right. um, for this time of year. And, and for whatever reason, who knows? Um, but we are seeing um, a few more people absent because of the time of year which is unusual, but not anything. I mean, we've been able to, to cover it and, and still provide um, those learning opportunities for kids. So at this time, I don't, I don't see that as an issue. I will say that um, there's conversation around the, um, the new mandate from the, from the president on the 100% vaccine or 100% of your um, population vaccinated or being tested every two weeks that I do think is something that we'll have to pay close attention to. We are um, in OSHA state, and so those guidelines do apply to us, and we do have over 100 staff members. So I think that that's, a, that's a, an issue we'll have to talk about when or if we get guidance from that. So 
Um, right now, I, I have no idea how many of our staff are vaccinated. We don't, we don't track that, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think that that'll be a conversation that will happen across the country, not just here. And I think we just have to, you know, pay attention to what, what the guidelines are and uh, make recommendations according to that. So that's something that I think is on the radar. Um, but like I said, not knowing anything that's been said about it, I, I, don't, I think it's premature to even start the conversation now because we don't have any more guidance than we're going to have to work through something. So. I just have a comment or maybe a question. When you said we've had discussions, you mean the administration, right? Correct. Because we can open communication laws. We can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, yep. but we can't have a conversation outside these walls uh, right. with, with a quorum. So I just right. wanted to make that right. clear. So, when, so what when I you say said we, we I so, thought, I, so Brandy Ransom, our <laughs> <right>. nurse, obviously, <laughs> we talked to public health. Um, and just to verify that we're still following the guidelines yep. and keeping our kids safe. Yeah. And we've, we've concluded that yes, based on our recommendations of masks optional, kids staying home when they're sick, good hygiene, you know, all those things that we're still doing here, um, we, we've, we feel like we're in a good place, so. No, that's good. Thank yeah, no, so we that. have had coverage. Yeah. And if a, no. if a board member has a question, I'll, of course. I'll respond to that. But no, I just wanted to make sure everybody heard the same thing. One last quick clarification, and I think everybody really understands this, but I just want to make sure that, so the Biden order with more than 100 employees going through OSHA and everything, that is for employees only that has zero effect on students. At Correct. This point. Okay. Correct. I just wanted to be, make Correct. sure that was very clear to everyone. Yep. So the, um, any other questions that you want me to get information on or? Okay. Um, the staffing shortages, uh, I think Brayton alluded to this a little bit. We are um, actively looking for people um, to work here. Um, we've got some substitute jobs available. We've got a couple of positions in our food service. Uh, and this really becomes an issue when we do have people sick. You know, so we're, we're short and we've got a, an amazing group doing um, things that, that they're really picking up and, and stepping up and helping each other out. The challenge is, is that I'm, I'm fearful when cold and flu season comes around that we're going to have kids sick, family members sick, the, you know, staff members sick. And so I guess I would just encourage if you know anybody, <laughs> um, if, you know, Jen Boffman and I went to the Camp Dodge um, for a job fair about three weeks ago and just tried to talk to people about what even were possibilities of jobs in schools and had some interest in some of our positions. But again, a lot of them were a younger group. So, you know, we'll go to the college fairs and, and try and talk to people there. But I think just having people ask questions about what positions we have available, we're really trying to get that information out. So if you know of anybody or if you've ever thought about working in the school, we just encourage you even to just come shadow for a day come see what it's like. We've had people that, you know, um, are doing associate jobs now that probably never thought they would, and, and I think they're enjoying it. So I, I just think that there's a lot here that we can offer people. So um, if they have, if anybody in the community or any of you know anybody, we would really like to visit um, because we, we think it's a pretty great place to work. We've got great kids, great community. So um, we wanna make sure that, that we're, we're able to continue to, to offer all those things that we do with staffing, so. Questions on that one? I think as a part of your superintendent report, we have two new employees back there. That oh just yeah, got there they are, the our volleyball, volleyball eighth, middle school volleyball coaches. So Tanya, Daddy who is our, um, eighth, can you come just step this way so our audience can see you too, uh, is our eighth grade English language arts teacher. And Stephanie Romanga is our um, special ed teacher for the middle school. So thank you guys for coming after your game. It's a long day. So thank you. How did it go? Excellent. <laughs> Other questions about staffing? Okay. Um, the other two things I had, professional development, um, we're really focused. We, we um, have talked extensively about using data and, and making decisions about instruction and about how we're spending time aligned with our data. And um, one of the things that 
is kind of an ongoing conversation is what does our math work look like? What, is, what are we doing with math? And so we do have our interventionists that were hired um, and they did target math right away because that's where our greatest need has been in the six through 12. And so um, all of those things, we've, we're working with John Butts who is a AEA consultant uh, through the Indianola office. And um, he will be here for professional development the next two Fridays that we have professional learning. We also have our math team working in a PLC professional learning community so that they can um, work together, um, look at what kinds of things kids are missing, look at things that are, are maybe struggles for kids, what concepts they're having a hard time with, and target instruction around some of that, offer some additional supports around that. So uh, we'll be reporting out on our math work probably two or three more times this year because we do know that that's, that's an important skill. Um, there's a lot of things that go into math. Even if you don't use geometry often, there are a lot of thinking skills that go into that, a lot of logic, a lot of sequencing. So all of those things we know are really important. So we're going to continue to develop that work. Um, and then the last thing I have is, or any questions about that? It's just real generic right now, but I want you to know that we are targeting and I will have um, some data once we get that collected and, and some direction once John has an opportunity to meet with teachers, so. I know um, we changed the math curriculum coming up, so how, I mean, I'm trying to remember, that's just been within the last year, right? Yeah, it's been, it's been progressively building in different levels. Um, anytime you adopt a, a new curriculum, it's about three to five years it for takes, implementation. Yeah. So, um, but that doesn't diminish the fact that we have opportunities to provide supports, whether in the classroom with small group work or interventions where kids maybe get a little bit more targeted supports for a skill maybe that they don't have a solid grasp on. So all of that stuff is what we're trying to work on as well. So as we get to closer to that third year, hopefully we'll see some of those leveling Correct. up type of things. Correct. So, okay. Correct. And then the last thing I have on there is the Rural Economic Task Force. Um, uh, Representative um, Axney and um, Representative Bustos were here, well, they were in Warren County. So I went over for their task force and I just thought it was good to reiterate some of the themes that we're hearing across all sectors um, for kind of economic development in rural Iowa. And so um, the, the kind of the big, the big challenges that we're seeing are staffing shortages, housing shortages, um, and, and really affordable housing shortage, shortages in rural Iowa, um, and um, trained, trained employees. So not, not only do we not have enough, but the ones we have aren't maybe trained at the level that companies are, are wanting them to come in at. So we talked about how or what does that look like in the future? And I think the conversation really has to be, if we look at Iowa and we look at business and industry here, what are skill sets that our students aren't getting that maybe they need? And so I know that that's one of the big pushes for um, Governor Reynolds, which is phenomenal. And we hear amazing things about our CTE program and how that's developing and how that's expanding. So we're excited about that, but we think that there's probably opportunities for that in our business education program. We think there are probably opportunities for that in, in some maybe some programs that we haven't really considered. I know that we were doing health occupations with um, Winterset and then they lost their instructor and they can't get somebody hired for that. So we've talked with um, Brandy about teaching that class or um, how do we get kids, you know, hands-on experiences when they wanna be a CNA or when they wanna work in the health field. So all of those things are conversations that I think um, this, the school I know is at least, we're receptive to it. It's just a matter of finding those partnerships and making it accessible for our students because if you're looking at CNA work, typically they partner with a nursing home so that they can, they can have hours and they can do some on-the-job on trainings. Um, unfortunately, that's not something we have readily available um, that, that's, that's within a, a couple of minutes of our, of our building. So we have to be, I think, a little bit more innovative how we're giving kids opportunities for some of that, especially when they get to that junior and senior year. So those are all things that we talked about um, at that task force. 
Um, just like anything, I think it was just a, an idea gathering, so I don't think it was anything um, too earth-shattering. Earth but I think it's important that we keep that conversation going because some of those same things that they're experiencing in different places in Iowa, we are experiencing here. So just keeping the conversation alive, is, I think, is really important. So. Just along those lines, I think it's cool that we have elder corporation coming to do that heavy machinery and the drone. Is that, well, how did that come about? Do you know? You might not even. I, you no, know, and we do have, I, I don't know how that specifically came about, but we do have lots of opportunities for our kids, or we at least try and find opportunities for our kids. So we'll take some students, you know, give them opportunity to sign up and go to something that maybe DMAC is hosting. We've had, um, I think our librarian in St. Charles did an activity with our kids um, on metal work um, about okay. two years ago. Yep. So in community, if you, you know, I guess I'm appealing to community. If you've got opportunities right. like that at your workplace that you think our kids would benefit from, where we can have kids, if it's an interest they have, actually come and see what it's like, we would, we would love to partner on that stuff. So we just need to know what those opportunities are. So I honestly don't know how that one came about, but it could be any number of ways. Yep. And then I just want to put a plug in for the career day. I think that's a really cool way for kids to interact with people in different industries and I didn't even know about it until I was on the board and I had to say hey you know I've I've got kind of a job that might be interesting to some so if there if there are others you know that might be or if you if if you could create a list of people in the private industry because I know I I had a kid from Martinsdale that I knew from church shadow me up at work and he thought it was so cool he's like these are you know he wanted to be an actuary he did and it just reaffirmed what he wanted to do yeah. so but yeah yeah neat yeah, Thanks. Lee um, Dentlinger got roped into that as hey. an engineer, so he's here at, during career day, and, and he actually really enjoys it. And I, I think that that's, that's one of those things people maybe don't realize, that talking with a group of five or six kids about what you're passionate about is, is actually, you know, kids want to be there. It's, fu it's a fun time. So it's a lot of fun. I guess I'm appealing to any community members, public, that, that have some of those opportunities for our kids. We'd love to, love to visit with you about it. Just make sure you, you know, be in touch with either um, Katie, I saw here, who's in our um, CTE building, or um, Kevin Boyce, or Mr. Castor. Yeah. Any one of them, I think, would be more than happy to, to work with you on some of those opportunities, so. Any other questions for Ms. Dettlinger? Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to our consent items. Um, everybody should have received their past meeting minutes. The monthly bills and financial statements and the addendum that came with it tonight. Uh, hires and resignations. We had Jesse Helton hired as an evening custodian. Bailey Balsian resigns from teacher associate position. And Joshua Klein hired as maintenance worker. Then everybody should have gotten the open enrollment. And we also are looking at the registrar student information systems and AD secretary. Is there any discussion or any questions on any of those items? Not hearing any, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, uh, consent agenda items. I'll second that. It's been properly and moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda items. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Items for discussion. Field trip request FFA National Convention. This does require a motion and a second to approve the field trip request. So I, I think Mrs. Klingensmith, or Mrs. Klingensmith went and got her students. They're going to actually present to you um, about this experience. So girls, you want to come on up? So I'm Hannah Bedwell. I'm Sienna Vodraska. I'm Lane Peterson. And we're three of the officers from our chapter. So we would like to attend the National FFA Convention. It's October 27th through the 31st, and it's in Indianapolis. And we'd also like to go to Louisville. 
Well, yeah, we'd like to stop at Louisville and check out the horse track there and find out all the interesting history and learn more about what we could do with like our leadership skills and what we can accomplish when we're older. Um, we really would like to attend the national convention because um, last year it was held virtually so we couldn't go. So this is a really good opportunity for us to go out and talk to people from all over the country and meet other people involved in FFA and find out about like their organizations and what they do at their schools. So then we can get like new ideas for ours and we can gain new perspectives about FFA too. So. We'd like to talk to some of the officers that, because I'm pretty sure our national president is from Puerto Rico, I think. So we could see like what they do there for their FFA and kind of compare to what we do for ours. So, anything else? <laughs> so the request is to go to the national conference. And so you have that in front of you. But if you have any questions for the ladies. How, how many students would be attending? It's our seven officers and then three other members. How is this being funded? Um, well, as of right now, um, we're trying to figure out fundraisers to do for it, but it's going to be out of pocket by us to go. Um, I noticed there'd be some chaperones and so on, and, and you'd be driving. So would, we, would there be rental vehicles, or how would that um, we wanted to get approval to take the school vans, okay. um, and then we were going to split up like six and six with a chaperone and five students in each van to drive out there. Okay. And now we've done this in the past, right? But since last year was virtual, did you, any of you get to attend when it, you were, I guess, not 10th graders, but earlier on? Um, no, none of us have been able to respond, um, go, but I know there's been a few other members like that have graduated that have been able to go. We go to Denver every other year. It's the last year in the National Convention. Okay. And will you come back to give us a recap on all the things you've learned and everything? I mean, we can. Your teacher's <laughs> shaking her head. I, I actually think that was a request. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll make a note and remind you. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, just out of curiosity, how long have you girls been involved with FFA? Since seventh grade. Seventh grade, seventh yeah, grade, so, yeah. yeah. Very good. Thank Any you. other questions? We could keep peppering them with questions. <laughs> and, yeah. Nope, okay. So this does require a motion and a second to approve uh, their field trip request. I would entertain a motion if someone would be so inclined. I move to approve the field trip request as presented. I'll second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the field trip request as presented. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Trip's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You Make us proud, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Let us know when the fundraisers are, too. <laughs> now, Ted, you're going to have to follow that up. The CAR Certified Annual Report FY21. The Certified Annual Report. Each year on September 15th, um, the Certified Annual Report is due. And along with that is the Special Ed Supplement and the Transportation Report. And so we follow up in the September meeting and give on my next. Sorry about that. Anyway, we follow up at the September meeting and it's a requirement that we share this with you and, and have, have you um, recognize that you've seen it. So that's what we're doing here. Um, I think the first one we should look at is the FY21 budget crosswalk as it does show most of the things that are, it summarizes it very well. Do you have a specific place okay. you want me to go? I think um, the first column is the one I want to look at first, the general fund. That's the fund that matters the most. Um, if you see, um, we started with a beginning fund balance on line 21 of $2,140,000. And we ended the year with, um, I had that 
So you're talking here, line 20? Yeah. So what line there? And then down below at the bottom, it's about $50,000 more we end it with at 2,189,687.84. So considering the amount of money, that's pretty close. And it's positive, so, so our fund balance grew slightly, which, which isn't bad. Um, do you have any questions as far as the revenues and that, or the expenditures? I mean, this summarizes it quite a bit, so it's, we'd have to uh, look at another report if we wanted to go any deeper. But let's just go on to the Student Activity Fund. As you can see, we started with the beginning fund balance of 116,000, and we ended the year with 119,000, uh, even with COVID. So the Management Fund Levy, um, 408,000 we started the year with. We ended with 411,000. Um, sales tax fund. Most of the sales tax fund dollars were used to pay the revenue bonds. That's, that's where all of it went because we started the year with a, a loan, a small loan. So we, after we paid that, it took care of the, the entire balance. Then the PEPL fund, which is another capital fund, just like the sales tax fund, we, we did put on a little bit of balance there, which is good. We started with 217,000 and ended with 333,000. And given the fact that we need to put on a new roof, we've got areas that are leaking and stuff like that, the money is being targeted for stuff like that, as you know, I mean. The debt service fund, that should stay pretty steady because um, so we started the year with 61,000 and ended with 56,000. So that's good. Nutrition fund. With the nutrition fund and the daycare fund, you get into OPEB liability. And that's an adjustment that actually the auditor gives me because it's, a, it's kind of a complicated formula. And it doesn't really mean much, but it can make your beginning and ending balance smaller because of that. So that's why you'll see um, in the other enterprise fund, which is the daycare fund, it's got a negative balance, even though we did in, end the year with a positive cash balance. Same with the nutrition fund, it shows a $28,000 positive balance that includes the OPEB liability. So. And I've always thought it weird that they allocate that down to the school district, even though it's a state run Right. you know, plan, whether it's IPERS or other benefits. And I know you've asked our I auditors I, yeah, questions about that yeah. in but past But anyway, that, that's neither here nor there, but I think it's silly that they allocate it to us. So, right, because we'll probably never pay it. You would hope not. Yeah, it should never come to yeah. us. So that's all I have for that. Um, in a nutshell, that really is the Treasury report as well, and that's the one that we're required to have you vote on or um, approve, I guess. Can you pull that one up? Um, it's the, so as you can see, that's pretty much the same thing. It starts with the beginning balance. It's got the revenues, expenditures, and the ending balance. So I won't repeat that if you have any questions on that. Um, would you like to see the um, transportation report? Yeah. Okay, can you pull that up? So what that says is um, we spent $57,000 on fuel um, we bought some equipment for video monitoring on the buses, 53,000. Um, school bus driver mechanics, supervisor um, salaries, 256,000. Benefits of 160,000. Vehicle insurance is 27,000. Drug and alcohol testing is about 1,000. For a total of 644,000 for transportation. And then we had a fuel, our fuel tax refunds which was for, from the propane um, from the IRS, almost 15,000. How about the SES? Should we look at that? Okay. 
and the special ed supplement is kind of an interesting set of information. All of this is fed from our accounting system and we put in different information regarding the uh, number of students we had at each level. Uh, let's just start on page screen one. Screen one just shows how much we um, pay out to the different school or districts in the state. So we pay out 150,000, or we did last year. It talks about the number of um, students that are tuitioned out. There were eight level one students, four level two, three level, I'm sorry, one level one, four level two and eight level one, sorry about that. So there, let's go to the next page. In all, we, we had 84 students that participated for at least one day. The next page. And the next one is who is tuitioned in. So we receive $154,000 from other districts. Um, the next one includes the receipts. That includes what we get from the state, 1,124,000. The next one is how we use um, Part B funds. I won't go through that. That's, that's federal funds that we get. Medicaid reimbursement, we, we received $30,000 or $30,900 from Medicaid, and we have to allocate that to salaries and benefits for those students. So t I'm going to interrupt for just a second, Ted. Yeah. So um, with some of these, you know, I, I mean, I know that he said we weren't going to talk about Part B, but that's funding that we get to provide programs for interventions and things like that. So it involves professional development for staff. It could involve resources, supplies, things like that. So um, I don't think we move over it quickly, but it's it's kind of routine stuff just to make sure that we can continue to offer programs and training for staff. Um, and then one of the things that I wanted to comment, some of the reasons why we have students out of the district, you know, like we pay tuition out is because we don't have a program here that will meet their needs. So if we don't have a program, let's say for a level three student, we might have to tuition them out to another district that does have the program. So some of it, some of it is because um, families might open enroll into another district, which happens just like we get open enrollment in with some special ed um, services. We also have some students that will be tuitioned out because we don't have a program here. So that all kind of is encompassed in that same category. So it, it just is a uh, special ed is its own, I would say beast because it is, but it, there's a lot of things that go into where that funding goes and how it goes. And, and so this is just a, a overall summary of that. So while we skip through it, I mean, the bottom line will come to our special ed deficit when we get to that and the agenda. Um, but I just wanted to maybe clarify a few more things about that because it is a, just a different kind of fund that we, we allocate money from. So. And if a student is open enrolled in and they're on special ed, if they're in special ed, then that would be in the tuition bin. Same with open enrolled out, that'd be in their special ed student, then they would be uh, open in, or special ed uh, out. Does that make sense? <laughs> what page are you on? Screen eight. Nine. I can go wherever. No, that's fine. Let's just go down to the bottom. At the bottom, it shows what the total deficit is. 269,163.05. And that's what we're gonna ask you to approve in a little bit. Would you like to see any other reports or is that fine? I'm okay, but it's not unusual for a public school to run a special ed deficit, right? No, it's quite it's common. Normal. Yeah. yeah. I, don't think I don't think we've ever had a year where it hasn't been in deficit. Sometimes and, and we're making way on the we're making headway on the deficit, right? It's getting up. And and part of the the reason why it fluctuates as well is um, 
it's based on um, yeah, it's based on students and students needs. Homes. So we might have a student that is a, a level three, which is the highest um, support services that are needed. And so we get 3.72 weighting. So that means we get three times what we would get from a 3.72 times what we would get for a, a general education student for that one student. But typically costs for that exceed the 3.72, which adds to the deficit. So. Um, yeah, it's it's the, the the waiting for students in special ed has not changed in the 25 years that I've been in Iowa education, and so um, it just hasn't really kept up with the change. You know, the the advances in technology, the um, changes to environments, and how some of those programs are being developed. So um, I, there's talk. I think there's always talk. That might be something we talk about on that legislative priorities. But there's talk about maybe thinking about are we allocating, and obviously that's state, or federal and state considerations, but um, it's one of those things that I don't think is kept up with the advancements that have been made. And so typically you do see a deficit. That's all, right. all I have. Any other questions or any questions for Ted on the uh, certified annual report? If I was a member of the public and I wanted, you know, our financials, or is there was there a place you can easily find them? Is it is there a place you can easily find our financials? Yeah, everything or? everything that Ted's reporting is found on the Department of Management website, and you can search by school. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Discuss and approve the fiscal year 21 financial annual settlement. This does require a motion and a second and a vote to approve the fiscal year settlement. Uh, Mr. Bauer. Yeah, and that is the, um, the treasury re treasurer's report that I gave you. Okay. So if you would just approve that or approve all the, the reports, that'd be great. That does require a motion and a second. Then we'll handle the uh, application for special ed deficit next. I'd move to approve the fiscal year settlement or FY settlement. I'll second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the FY21 financial annual settlement. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Application for the special education deficit. Yeah, so this is um, related directly to the special ed report um, that you that you saw. Um, it, it just is the difference between the monies that we um, that we are allocated for our students and their waiting, and the services that we provide, and the difference between those two. So, we're asking for um, spending authority in the amount of two hundred sixty-nine thousand. $163.05 for this year's special education deficit. And again, this is a routine. I mean, every year I've been on the board, we've had to take up this very item. I move approval of an application to the school budget review committee to receive an additional spending authority in the amount of $269,163.05 for the fiscal year 21 special education deficit. And I'll second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the application for the special education deficit. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much, everybody. Ted, thank you for all your hard work on that as well. Um, legislative priorities. This is for discussion only. Um, the Iowa Association of School Boards in providing the legislative platform for consideration. Um, we've gotten information on the different uh, priorities that I think they've identified. Is that correct, Sharon? Yeah, this is um, the information that's found on their website. It's, it's pretty consistent from year to year, unless a major legislative event has happened that has you know, taken something off, then it stays on typically. Or if there's a need that's come up kind of across different districts, then they'll add to the priorities. So <coughs> usually it's on-time funding. Usually it's um, 
uh, allowable or a, a student growth rate uh, equivalent to you know inflation um, at the at the least. So um, those are those are things we always talk about. <coughs> excuse me, um, early childhood, and I think we. I, I encourage you always to put that on the agenda or on the um, priorities. We do have, because of our location, <coughs> full day preschool. We're only funded for part day preschool. So we actually um, pass some of that expense on to parents. And so if we could have full day preschool because of location and availability of daycare and things like that, um, and get funding for the full day program, then that would really, I think, alleviate some of the, the burden on our parents um, and, and it would still provide really quality um, opportunities for kids. So um, that's one that I, I will continue to recommend. I think um, it's important um, that we continue to advocate for that just because of our location and, and the needs of our, our families and our students. So. And they just ask that I go into the website and put down what, what are the ideas we have. So if we have other things that are not on here, I can add those. It really doesn't have to be any kind of motion. I just need ideas and feedback so I can go in and report out what, what we want them to advocate for. So I got a question here. Um, when we're talking about IA, IASB and the priorities they're pushing, sometimes they're not in line with such entities as the rural schools. Um, Sometimes they do. They mirror mm -hmm. them pretty closely. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Margaret sent out some information. Um, do you have any idea what she's targeting right now? Again, the same, the same big ones that I probably recommend every year. Yeah. Um, On-time funding. Um, and then, obviously, growth at the rate of inflation at, uh, at a minimum. Um, and then preschool, I would recommend. Um, there are some that if you look at the um, packages, you know, there's, they make suggestions about, you know, employee uh, relations and collective bargaining. And, and I think we have really worked hard here to um, form our labor management committee and to make sure that our handbook still retained as much um, that the unions had negotiated with or for over the last several years and then um, created a handbook ha that has the other information. We, we really worked hard to work with the, the two um, bargaining units that we have, and we try and be proactive so we meet monthly and try and work through any things that are coming up. And, and I would say it's been a, a, a really positive relationship. So I don't know that I would recommend that, but the bargaining units might, just because it's a security. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I would say if you're, if you're interested in things like, like that one, maybe more specifically, that it would be good to get feedback from that group as well, since obviously you represent not just the administration, but all teachers. So, um, but like I said, we worked really hard to, to be proactive on some of these things. So regardless of what the legislation is, we're still supporting our teachers and our, and our support staff. So. Um, I know that there's been talk about, <clears throat> you know, property taxes. We had the, um, Mr. Stewart here um, addressing things like that and, and trying to get in property tax relief and what does that look like. And I think some of that, um, maybe it would be beneficial for us to do a, I know about two and a half or three years ago, we did an overview of where, our, where the tax dollars went. Um, in school, so I can put something like that together again, just so people are aware um, and get feedback on, on ideas and suggestions or, or recommendations from community, and we can work through some of that. But um, the, 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 the things like um, we have in school finance, we have a general fund, and in that general fund, we have specific categories of funding that you can only use for certain things, and so maybe cleaning up some of that would be beneficial to advocate for, but I think that's always on the agenda, um, you know, from every school. So, I, yeah, I would say, obviously, funding is a big one. I would say kindergarten or preschool for us is a big one. Um, you know, there's sharing agreements, which if we could add more positions to our sharing agreements, I think would benefit our students. Um, what, what that could look like, we currently are in a sharing agreement that just was approved last year for um, what they call a transition counselor. So we have a, a transition counselor here two days a week that works with kids specifically on what are your goals for next, what, what supports do you need, and then they actually follow up with them 
once they leave here and, and make sure that if there's anything else that we can do or that they, that they need, that we can work with them even when they're beyond just our pre-K-12. Um, so that's a shared position. We probably wouldn't be able to afford that if we did it independently, but because we get sharing dollars and we can, and we can um, coordinate with other districts, it makes it something that's affordable and another service for our students. So anytime we can um, expand those sharing things, I think that's an opportunity um, that is beneficial. Um, Ted, any for finance that you would recommend that we? I didn't really see any, no. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Other than, other than, Ted just wants to make sure we get paid on time. <laughs> <laughs> on time funding, so. So with the priorities that you mentioned, and most of those line up very well with the IS, IASB uh, mm -hmm. priorities that are listed on this, um, really it's about trying to get more competitive wages for our staff and teachers. And mm -hmm. I know that's easier said than done, but um, it's not gonna get any easier here in the next few years. And we, this is the age-old fight, right? But um, I think it's becoming more and more apparent that uh, that fight needs to be had. Um, we need to find a way to get more competitive, to get um, quality people in here to educate our children. Mm -hmm. so One, I think this is, the yeah, this is the first year that you're going to see inflation numbers pick up. Yeah. And so hopefully that's taken into account because otherwise hopefully you're the, losing ground if you're not keeping up. Yeah. So. Hopefully, but what's that percentage increase has been pretty weak here in the last five years, and are they actually going to do something about it in this next year? So that would be one of the priorities I would like to see. It all goes back to funding, I understand. Yeah. And I agree with that one. And then the other two that stuck out to me were the COVID-19 rem remediation, so like mm -hmm. finding the kids that are behind or got essentially knocked back even farther. But I think we're doing some of that with our fast testing and we're trying to identify those things on a district level. And then the mental health. Um, I know that's a huge one that I think is only growing. And this is, a, this is a hard list to narrow down, right? You go through every one of those and you're like, yep, let's focus on that and that one and that one and that one. And pretty soon you got a list of 50 things. But those are the two that kind of talk to me outside of the competitive wages thing. Right. And that's, that's a perfect example of one of those things that we'll probably continue to ask for advocacy for, but because we know it's such a value that we've done a lot already just to support kids with what we allocate money for. So we have um, a partnership with Wildwood where we have kids go over and, and work through, um, you know, once a week. Um, we identify students that maybe are struggling in, um, in relationships or in socialization or, and, and they go over and they are there, I think, six weeks and then we send another group over and it's all about developing confidence and leadership and resilience. We also, um, just it, with, our, with our current allocation of our funds here, is we um, have a, a mental health counselor that's here that families can use, um, that they can use private insurance for, or if they don't get private insurance, we have options for them to make use of those services. So kids don't have to leave school to, to see a mental health counselor if, if it works for parents. Um, I think she even sees sometimes family. So trying to be proactive because we know we have those needs regardless of what we do with advocacy. We know that's a very important thing. So we're, you know, Joe Beckman coming in is exactly for that reason to, to give kids strategies and tools to be, um, to, to hopefully be proactive in creating some of that. So you're exactly right. We can advocate, but some of these things are just so important that we're, we're doing things regardless because we know it's just that important so that's just an example and i just we're going to tag on but those are the two that jumped out at me too with with that so all right is there any other conversation uh around our legislative priorities and as you i guess as you identify them uh send them to sharon yeah so uh we can keep that conversation at the forefront so that being said that brings us to the end of the agenda um, we do uh, our next regular board meeting is scheduled for October 26th at 6 p.m. Um, don't hear any conflicts at the moment but uh, I will take a motion to adjourn I'll make a motion to adjourn our meeting 
Second. It's been properly moved and seconded that uh, we go into adjournment. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>